Hey everybody, Chris here again. Welcome back to the channel. Always good to have you with us. So today, I'm finally getting around to a video that I've been wanting to make for a while. We're going to boot MS-DOS, but not in the way that you normally see. You see, when you go to boot MS-DOS, you may use a simple floppy disk, or you may boot it up using a hard disk. Today, we're going to use neither of those technologies, and we're going to boot up over the network using my 3Com Etherlink 3 card and a Landworks boot ROM. So first, we're going to cover a precondition where we talk about the network settings we need for the network card to conduct this procedure. And then I'm going to show you the setup for my Windows NT server running in a virtual machine. And yes, our server today is completely virtual. We'll then have a bonus round where we configure our MS-DOS session to use TCP IP for LAN manager support. And then finally, I'll give you my thoughts in the wrap up. So without further ado, let's go. So there is one precondition we need to worry about. When we start up and get to this screen on the client, we can do a control alt B to get to this configuration screen. And we need to make sure the boot protocol is set to RPL. And we do have several options with this Landworks Tri-ROM, including boot P, some network options, DHCP, etc. But it needs to be set to RPL. For default boot, you can either make this network or a local, deciding if it will boot to the network or if it will boot local when starting up the machine. So that's your choice. I chose local. So to configure remote boot, first we're going to set up an NT server virtual machine. So here you can see I've gone into virtual box and selected new and I typed in Windows NT server, set the memory to 256 megabytes, and we're going to create a virtual hard disk of type VMDK. And the defaults are fine, so we'll just go ahead and click on through this. Two gigabytes is great. And we have a virtual machine. Now, we're going to configure the network card to bridge to a wired network card. If you bridge to wireless, this will not work. It needs to be wired. So I will choose my Realtek card there and click OK. And we are now bridged to a wired card. Good. Let's go ahead and start up. And as we start up, we will be prompted for an ISO. I'm going to put the Windows NT server ISO into the virtual CD-ROM drive. And from there, we can start the installation procedure of NT 4.0 server. So here we can see NT doing its nice startup and we get to the screen and can press enter and then enter again. And then we can press C to continue setup saying we don't have a hard drive set up. Page down, page down, page down a million times and F8 to agree. Of course, read all that first. Enter on this screen to continue. C to create a partition on this screen. Enter to choose the default size and then enter to go ahead and select format and then arrow down to NTFS. And from there, your NT initial setup is pretty much complete. Enter to choose the WinNT directory. And once again, enter to allow an exhaustive disk test. Not necessary on a virtual machine, but it doesn't hurt. Cool. So from there, NT will finish its initial setup. We can go ahead and remove the disk from the drive, as it says, and reboot by pressing Enter. And then press Enter there, and it will go ahead and do some work, reboot, and then it will continue the installation. But of course, you need to put the CD back into the drive. So go ahead and do that. So we'll do that here. And then we can click OK, and the process will continue on. Very good. So a little bit of lightning round, but that's fine. From here, we just go through the rest of the steps. We can do our next, put in our name, and you are forced to put in an organization. Setup cannot continue without it. So put something in for that. And then from here, I just set my licenses to five per server and then clicked next, put in a computer name. I just called this NT boot and that works for me. And it's going to be a standalone server. So we can select that option as well. Moving on, I'm not putting an administrator password in and I'm not creating a repair disk. The default components are fine. So we'll click next on that. And then next to do the rest of setup, we will participate on a network. So next, 
I don't want to install Microsoft Internet Information Services or server, so next. We can do a start search to find our adapters. It will find it instantaneously. Next. And then we need to add some protocols or a protocol. So select from list and choose DLC protocol. That's needed for remote boot. And enable NetBuoy. For some reason it's not enabled, but it's there. Go figure. Okay. On this screen, we need to add the remote boot service. So we can scroll down just a little bit in the list there and find it. And we can select it and click OK. And we will have remote boot service ready to install. Great. So go ahead and click Next. You can see everything is selected. So you can go ahead and click Next. And things will start to happen once we click Next here. There it goes. OK. So some default settings for the network card. Just hit Continue. There's nothing to do here. And then yes to allow DHCP. That's great. And also continue for the location for RPL. We will certainly become familiar with that later. And then we've got this goofy thing where we actually have to point the path to something it already knows about, except for you can't just put the path in. You have to put the drive letter in too. I don't understand this, but whatever. It's NT. What do you expect? So continue on at that point and it will finish out. From there, we get this screen. We can hit next and then next again. And then we can check everything here. Computer name and workgroup are fine. And then finish to finish setup. And we can choose a time zone. I just use the arrow keys and I go backwards because I'm minus 500. <laughs> it's just easier than going all the way around the world. I don't know if you could anyway. So there we've got that. For the display, we're just going to leave it alone. We're not going to do anything fancy. I'm not even going to try to make it better. 640 by 480 is fine. It will continue to do its thing and ask to show us the log file because it failed to create a swap file or something. Whatever. That's fine. Just click close. It'll work fine. From here, we can restart. So let's go ahead and remove the CD from the drive so it doesn't try and boot on it. And we can click on restart. So all good stuff. Almost done. There's a couple more things we need to do after I go ahead and restart here. So we can log in by doing control delete since control is the host key and that will simulate a control alt delete by doing control delete. Okay. At this point, we get to install NT service pack three and you guessed it. We need to put the CD back in the drive again. If I had a nickel for every time we did that during this installation, did anybody keep count? Anyway, back in it goes and we can expand the screen and click OK. And it brings up this nice screen too, because it detected the disc. Just close it if you can. And then from there, click OK. And then from there, click Next. And click Yes to agree. And then Next again. And yes, no, we don't need to create an uninstalled directory. We have nothing to save. It's a brand new installation. Next and finish. And it will do its thing rather quickly after all that. I go ahead and keep the higher grade security file. So I hit skip for that. It doesn't really matter for what we're doing. Okay. Okay. So now we can go ahead and remove the disk from the drive and restart. And yeah, great. I'm doing this quickly on restart. It's going to pop up an installer. Just click uncheck the checkbox and click exit. And then from there, it will not bother you ever again. So good. All right. Cause there's nothing that we care about there. Okay. Finally, now we can do something. So if we go to settings and control panel, the first thing we're going to do is enable the remote service, the remote boot service, because it's not enabled by default. It's set to be manual and that's by design. So we can go in there and find it and we can double click on it and then change it to automatic and click OK. And then from there, I'm going to click start so that we can start it for the first time. And then on subsequent reboots, it will start automatically. Cool. So now we can go ahead and configure to remote boot MS-DOS. And I'm following this nice article here. It's a Microsoft article. Somebody has archived them. Thank you very, very much. This is very good and very helpful. So we will pretty much follow this. So without further ado, here we go. So what we want to do is run the remote boot manager, which should be accessible under programs, administrative tools, remote boot manager, but it's not. There's some sort of a bug. I didn't take the time to find out why, when, what, or where. What I did instead was go to drive C and then go to WinNT, and then go to system 32 and then just find it. 
find it's executable because it's in there under the R's. So we can find that. And there it is, RPLMGR, and right click on it and say, create shortcut. That'll create a shortcut. I'm gonna drag that to the desktop. And that's how we're gonna launch it today. Uh, there's probably a fix for it on the administrative menu, but I'm not gonna worry about it. Okay, so with that going, we can then go and look at the RPL directory. And the first step in the directions is make sure that RPL files is shared. It is not, there's no blue hand under it. So I'm gonna load the RPL manager and it's going to give us a warning that we don't have any profiles. That's fine. What we can do is go up to configure and say fix security and then yes, and that will fix it. And for good measure, I'm also going to do a configure and check configurations though. I can tell you, you don't need to, but it doesn't hurt anything. Right? Right. Cool. Let's refresh this little screen over here. And if we do that by going to view and refresh, we will see we now have a magic blue little hand, or I guess a blue sleeve with a white hand. So that is now shared and fixed. Good. Step one, complete. All right. So now step two is to copy your DOS files over. The first thing I'm going to do is log on as administrator because we're going to be connecting to this NT share and we have to have the right username. From there, we can map NT boot RPL files to drive M on our client machine. And this is actually not the real client machine. This is just another virtual machine I have. It doesn't matter. The key thing is we need to be able to get a DOS 6221. So by going to bin files, DOS 622, we're going to copy our MS-DOS directory to this location. And that will give us all of the DOS programs that we need. Excellent. The next thing we need to do is actually copy IOSYS and MS-DOSSYS. But in order to find them on our drive, we need to make them unhidden and unsystem well, at least unhidden. So we can do that for both files and then they will be available to copy to the volume. So there we go. There's file number one and here we go. Here's file number two. And once done, let's go ahead and run a trib to set them back so that this virtual machine will actually boot again. I don't think it'll boot if they're not system and maybe not hidden. I haven't tried it, but I don't think it would work. Perfect. With that, we can go configure and check configurations and it will actually generate what we need so that we can create a profile. So now we can go remote boot, new profile, and go to configurations, and we have a DOS 622 3Com Etherlink 3 profile. Perfect. So let's go ahead and name it accordingly. Nice long descriptive name. Okay, and we now have a profile. That's great. So at this point, we can actually start booting the system, and it will put an entry into the table on the NT server. When we hit F5, that entry appears. However, we have not authorized or assigned it to a profile. So we can convert the adapter and then go down and choose the workstation profile we care about and give it a name. So I'm just gonna call it 486DX4 and we have our default profile selected. So there you have it. Now, if we return back to the system, it will catch wind of this and it will continue the boot process and it will now forever boot. And it's asking us for our username and password. We did not set one. So we can just wait for that to time out. And look at that, we're now booting MS-DOS. Isn't that cool? All right, so we have a nice C prompt. We can explore a little bit. Let's look around. We'll see a variety of files. We have a nice data directory where we can put data in. I'll go ahead and edit a test file and put a line in there just to show that. Kind of cool. We can save this in this location, very nice. That said, there are some locations where we can't save files. So I'm gonna change into the bin directory, or at least one of them here, the bin B directory. And if we go there and try to put a file, it's going to be read only, but we'll give it a shot just so you can see. So I cannot save this file in here. I get a path file access error. Of course, I'll try it twice because why not? And once again, a path file access error. So let's get out of here. So the other thing I'm curious about is if we edit auto exit bat, will the change be persisted through a reboot? So we can go to the bottom of the file here and go ahead and add a line. We'll say echo, will this change be saved after reboot? And we'll just go ahead and save the file and let's go ahead and reboot. And lo and behold, it does. It echoed out to the console. So the change was saved. Cool. So let's explore what that looks like a little bit. 
If we go into the RPL files and machines, the first thing we'll go look at is the data directory. And we can see there's our test file. So it got saved within the hierarchy of RPL files that exists for remote boot. We can even make a copy of this file if so desired. And then if we return back to the DOS prompt and do a DIR, we can see it's there. No reboot was necessary. It was there immediately, which is actually a pretty cool feature. Now, as far as deciding which files are where, which files are editable, we have to look at this fit file. And if we look at the fit file, recall earlier that we tried to save files to a bin directory. And if we scroll down here a little bit, we can see there are some shared binary files in the bin R and bin B directories, and those directories are not editable. However, there's a whole section for machine writable files, including the data directory and a workstay directory as well. So that's how we were able to either save or access files and it explains the mappings between where files actually live within the Windows NT 4.0 structure as compared to how they get served to your remote boot clients. Next up, it's time for the bonus round. What we're going to do is configure TCP IP for our DOS session. And the reason I want to do this is my Raspberry Pi has files that are accessible, but only via TCP IP file sharing over SMB. So I apologize for not showing it, but what I have done is to make an identical copy of the profile and named it TCP-D622ELINK3. And you can see that there at the bottom of the screen. So now what we're going to do is make some modifications to the boot block for all 3Com Etherlink 3 cards. So I'm going to go in and modify this DOS BB file that you see here. And this is going to be for all DOS configurations that use this particular card. And we're going to uncomment one line, that TCP drive.dos line. So we uncomment that, and then we can go ahead and save the file. And that's going to be one driver that we need in order to make this work. So excellent. OK, let's go ahead and save that. The next thing we're going to do is actually modify this new profile that we made. So I'll navigate back and go to the RPL files directory. And then we can go to profiles and find our profile there on the right. So we're going to go into this autoexec.bat file and uncomment three lines. First, this umb.com line that you see here. And second, this load TCP IP line. And finally, this nmtsr line. And then we can go ahead and save autoexec.bat. And next, we're going to load config sys. But first, let's go ahead and say view options and make sure when you go to view that you have all the hidden files shown. I've already done this. This is not the NT default. So now we can see config sys and we can go in and edit it and go down to notepad to choose an editor. And we're going to make a few changes. All we really have to do is uncomment the last line. But I also like EMM386 to run. And I like Hyman Sister Run without actually doing a memory test, so I'm going to turn off that. And then finally, the only thing we have to do is uncomment that last line. So there you have it. Great, we can save this out. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to go modify the other profile too, <laughs> so that I have EMM386 and Hyman Sys not testing memory. There you go. Lightning round on that. Perfect. Okay. So at this point, we are going to switch the profile out. I clicked on 486DX4, I can come down to the workstation profile, change it to TCP, and we click OK. That easy. Now when we reboot, we can see all the TCP IP goodness, and we can also map a drive to our Raspberry Pi, and that will work flawlessly. So now drive Z is mapped. So let's have some fun. I'll go to the data directory. I'm going to copy WordPerfect 5.1 off of the Raspberry Pi onto this nice booted system. So we can go ahead and do that. I'll grab that, and then we will be able to see what we've got memory-wise, and we'll just go ahead and launch it. I do want to show what we have memory-wise. And you can see that 188K of conventional memory is used. TCP is a hog. But we can launch WordPerfect. Everything looks good. Great. So at this point, I'm actually going to shut down and switch over to the other profile. But based upon how files work here, our WordPerfect 5.1 should still be in place. As we reboot here and we check our memory first, you can see we are now using 100K less, and we can go to the data directory, WP5.1, and run WordPerfect without any other changes. So that's pretty cool. 
And of course, this does require sysadmin changes. So if you wanted to actually make this more configurable, you can see I've modified config sys and auto exec bat to have a nice DOS menu. That's what this is all about. It's definitely an option. And then when we go to boot, we can choose whether or not we want TCP IP running and whether or not we want to use that extra, oh, what was it, 100 kilobytes of memory or not. So it's nice to have choices. And if we do things this way, we're not dependent upon the system administrator to switch profiles for us. So that works out rather nice. All right, well, that's what I had for you today. Hope you enjoyed it. I found this to be a pretty slick technology, actually. I thought it was pretty cool. I liked how dynamic it was when we added new files and the configurability options. It definitely gets a thumbs up in my book. I guess it's a little bit sad, or maybe it's a good thing, that it got supplanted by other technologies that came later, for example, terminal server technologies. Now, it is fair to say, though, that this technology was used for Windows 95 as well, and I'll be showcasing that in a future video. I wanted to give a shout out to Andy Proctor, who gave the idea for this video series, in particular the 95 video that we'll be seeing in the future. Definitely subscribe to the channel so that you can see when that video comes out, ring that notification bell, and you'll know for sure. Also, if you like what you saw today, I'd appreciate if you gave us a thumbs up. If not, consider sending me a strong message by pressing that thumbs down button twice. As always, it's been great having you along for the journey, and I look forward to seeing you next time. But until then, bye for now.